Hello everyone. Welcome to the Healing Growth Podcast. My name is Saiton Riga and this is a podcast where we talk about healing trauma in an African faith context. Today's episode is the one about vulnerability. I'm so grateful to have you listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Anchor, and Spotify, and for sharing your feedback. We also just got on the Edify Podcast Network, so make sure you download the app on Edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app, and go and listen to us there. For more podcasts to build up your faith, head over there. We are on episode 11. Yay! I'm so excited to have made it this far. This is also our very first full YouTube podcast. I'm nervous about it. I'm also excited, but let's let's go on the journey. Thank you also for the feedback and the stories on healing. If you'd like me to read them out, send them on our email, which is healing.growthpodcast at gmail.com. On Instagram, we are healing.growth and on Facebook, trauma healing and growth. Um, this is a podcast about vulnerability, so I'll just be vulnerable here that this is a big, big, big deal for me. I prefer being behind the scenes, writing, maybe on audio. So this one is a big step and to doing things that we are supposed to do and stretching ourselves and being vulnerable as we do it. So, yeah. So I'm one of those people who's always trying to figure out things, especially when it comes to something I'm interested in. I think it goes back to just how God designed me. And if things don't make sense, I get curious, I turn them around in my mind, I research until I have an explanation that makes sense to me. I may share it, I may not, but once it settles within me, I have a greater sense of confidence moving forward. And even if I do change my views or have additional information, I know exactly where to retrieve that line of thought and belief and whether to add or subtract from it. The interesting thing is that I wasn't always like this. I used to have a very fixed, what, what I believe is called a fixed mindset. And things were very black and white. And it's been interesting how that as I've healed, I've been able to gain a lot more empathy and a lot more perspectives on things and be able to stand on what is important for me and allow others to do the same for themselves. This week, I was listening to something and I heard a phrase that really made me think. The, speak, the speaker was Lisa, T I believe her name is Lisa Tickhurst. You can Google it. Um, she was discussing dysfunction and boundaries and she said the phrase, Children explain and adults inform. And she was explaining how to handle boundaries that as an adult, you should just inform that this is a boundary. But it made me think about how children are constantly making sense of their world by asking questions and being curious and explaining how they think. It's a skill. The skill that I'd love to take from them is asking questions, because in my experience, Questions create room for honesty and vulnerability. However, when children experience trauma or difficult things and don't have a trusted adult to explain things to them, they create an explanation in their mind, often blaming themselves because they cannot imagine the fault or the issue being with their caretaker. Now, if, you, if you've ever heard the questions that children have, the explanation and the explanations, they can really be out there as evidenced by the many videos we watch and experiences we have with the children around us. When your primary parent says goodbye and pr promises to come back for you or to have you join them and then you don't see them for a full year and then another year and then another year, a story is formed to explain that. When another parent Say your dad says he's coming to visit you 
and you get excited, get ready to spend the day with him, and then he doesn't show up, a story explanation is formed. If your mother is abusive or absent or neglect, neglectful, if the relatives that you stay with are less than kind or outrightly unfair, there are stories we tell ourselves to explain these things. These stories are often centered on our worth, our shame, around our being unlovable and unwanted because we did something to deserve it. Or that we need to do more to be worthy of love. Or we need masks to fit in and be accepted. As we go on with life, we add more and more things that add on to these stories and soon they form the cornerstone of our life philosophies and ethos. I am reminded of the verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 11 which says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man, I am done with childish ways and have put them aside. I want to emphasize on the reasoning like a child. Part of growing up is assessing what we are leaving behind from our childhood. It's often easier to leave the outer markings, the clothes, the habits, the schools, all of those things. But I have a question. Have you ever stopped to trace where the beliefs you have about yourself, about loving someone else, about being loved, about being worthy of good, faithful, steadfast love, about being worthy of better things, or believing that good things are for others and not for you, about believing that you can only succeed by being cutthroated and underhanded, have you ever stopped to trace where all of these beliefs came from? Have you figured out what happened to you or the effects of what you saw growing up? Have you figured out that there may be other frameworks and belief systems to live by, that you don't have to go by these? You can't change what you can't find. If you go shopping and you forget your shopping, say in a public vehicle or in another shop, you can't cook with the things that you plan to cook. If you don't have them, you don't have them. We can't say that we're done with the reasoning that we had as children if we can't trace it and if we can't see it in the stories that we tell ourselves. Some of these stories are come together with lies that we were told or lies that we believed that have formed the cornerstone of who we are as adults. This is where vulnerability comes, comes in. As part of my healing, I worked with a coach, Dilesia hampton Bana, who runs the International Mother-Daughter Trauma Recovery Institute. Their website is imdtri.org. And one of the most excruciating processes involved identifying the lies I believed from the events that happened to me and the stories that I had told myself as a child and even some as an adult because this had become my go-to coping mechanism. It, it completely stunned me how many of these lies existed and how... The, how much they had framed my understanding of the world, the way I moved in the world, and what I set out to achieve and what I set out to walk away from. I think for me, it was confusing how, how set they were and how subtle they were and how ingrained they were in almost every facet of my life. Before that, I had thought I was certain of the narrative and the story and how it had played out. What I hadn't realized is how these initial experiences and others had played into the insecurities and lies that I had been carrying for years. The father of lies and the trauma that is created and how these intertwine with who we become as adults. One of the things that I came to understand is how being in a place of deep, deep emotional pain 
makes us susceptible to the lies that are built on the original childhood explanations and also the misinterpretation of certain things because we're in full fight or flight mode and our brain has only the capacity to do what it needs to do to keep us alive and ensure our survival. We need far more time, patience, a safe space and help to unravel the situations and even to get to the place of considering other points of view. It makes sense that in the moment, you do what you need to do to survive and keep going. But at some point, you're no longer surviving. You're safe. When are you going to stop and take stock of what happened to you? If somebody has an accident, the first thing we do is first aid and medical care, and we're ensured recovery most times. But with emotional and mental health, we seem to have it upside down. We keep going and going and going and going until something breaks or things stop working. I also understand that for so many of us, the bigger fear is if we stop doing the things that we have been doing to survive, everything will fall apart. Or that there's just way too much stuff to get through it. There are are others still who don't want to admit the things that deep down they know. I just want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're carrying so much pain. I'm sorry that you've been hurt by both the people who should have loved you and by strangers and people who should have done right by you. I'm so sorry that these things have led you to disqualify yourself from having the things that you desire the most. And I'm sorry that you think that it's okay for you to miss out on the things that your heart longs for the most. Learning about vulnerability was one of the first things that made something click in my brain. I value vulnerability highly, even though back then I didn't fully understand when to be vulnerable, and who to be vulnerable with. If I can explain what it is to me, vulnerability is a freedom to be authentically myself and to express myself to those I love and my immediate community and being willing to accept whatever the consequences are. One of the foremost researchers on vulnerability is Brené Brown. She actually researches shame, vulnerability, worthiness, and connection, among other things. Technically, I feel like she's a person who figures out and researches how we can have better relationships with others and ourselves. She defines vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. The fascinating thing is that vulnerability is at the heart of two things the core of shame, fear, and the struggle for worthiness. Worthiness is basically whether or not you feel worthy of love, care, and other things. And the core of all of this is vulnerability. Vulnerability is also the birthplace of joy, creativity, and belonging. And I think for me that that's really hopeful that... Right in between these two things, the paths that we choose is this thing called vulnerability. And by choosing it, we can end up in a place of joy, creativity, and belonging. According to her research, and I would recommend looking for her TED Talk, which she did, I believe, in 2011, and her books, one of the main variables that differentiate the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging to those that struggle with it is the strong sense that they believe that they are worthy of it. The other variable is the courage to be imperfect. I strongly believe that this is what we need more of right now. The obsession with perfection keeps us paralyzed and unable to be and do what we are on earth to do and be. 
For years, I held back and silenced myself because it didn't measure up. And I do know this is many of us. But here's what I say. Do the work. Start healing. Do the research. Create the art. Write the stories. Do your best and let it go. It's in that courage that you connect with yourself. You connect with other people. And you find a sense of purpose and living in this world. I presume that you need to be vulnerable with yourself before you can be vulnerable with other people. To deeply know ourselves is not something that people talk about, but it is my opinion that the longest relationship that you have is with yourself. And you can learn how to be vulnerable with yourself. So many times we are so used to putting on a mask for everyone else. And then we forget to even remove the mask with ourselves. And then we end up believing the illusion and lying to ourselves. Do you truly see yourself? Do you truly know yourself? Do you truly hear yourself? Do you take time each day to think about what happened or what, uh, what is going to happen and how you feel about it? as well as what you can do to prepare? Can you admit to yourself that you're afraid, that you're ashamed, without being critical? Can you treat yourself the way you would a beloved friend? Can you admit when you've wronged yourself with the decisions that you've made? Can you admit you've wronged someone else? Can you journal and write about this? Can you ask yourself why you felt it necessary to lie about something? Can you ask yourself why you're more comfortable pretending in front of person X, Y, and Z? <laughs> Are you willing to ask yourself if you really wanted this career or not? Can you ask yourself questions that you don't know the answers to? Can you ask yourself why it's so important to project a certain image on social media? Can you admit to yourself that you are angry at God and de detail the reasons why? Can you? We numb the emotions to run away from feeling pain, but because it's not as simple as a switch in your brain, when we numb pain, we also numb the joy, the love, the gratitude, and the happiness. I'm asking, are you willing to take the step today to stop numbing and commit the journey to and commit to the journey of discovering who you are and building and finding community where you can be your true and authentic self? I think one of the reasons we struggle with being vulnerable is social media. In social media, the currency for fame and money has been perfection. The glitz and the glamour, even if it's manufactured. There's a whole industry of gossip blogs taking down influencers and celebrities because we're trying to find the imperfections in the perfect stories that they tell us. I dare say all this glitz and glamour can often be like cotton candy, disappearing as soon as it's in your mouth. Seeming like you have it all together has been the currency for fame, but not for the acceptance that we all truly crave and need. It's like a never-ending race of doing more and more to get people to give you this thing that you think in the end, that you need, but in the end it's a trap because you can never find places to speak of your true struggles and pain. My hope is that more and more of us get off the perfection chain and start to seek authentic relationships with people who truly know and accept us. It takes courage to build that, to see 
others and to be seen to create safe spaces and relationships. Indeed, the main reason why we don't do this is because we've been hurt. The imperfection of it all is part of the human experience. Learning who to trust is important and engaging with them at the level of their commitment. Lisa said something really interesting. We need to understand in our relationships the level of commitment people have. If somebody has a level one commitment, share with them at that level. If somebody is a level 10, share with them a level 10 because the more they're committed, the more they're willing to be there for you and the more they're willing to see you for who you truly are. Somebody with a level 10 commitment is not ready to, as ready to leave as a level one commitment. And yes, things can change and things happen. But part of building a relationship is taking the risk. The peace, love and acceptance you find can be worth so much more than the fear that you're always carrying. One of the other things I've noticed is that we're more comfortable with being vulnerable with our physical bodies than our emotional selves. Our deepest, deepest, deepest fears and the genuine stories of how we became who we are are things we hide. It's become cool to make fun of vulnerability and yet this is the loneliest we've been as a society. We want to be loved and to be with someone, but we also hold back so that you don't, you don't get hurt, but you're also robbing the other person a chance to know the real you. There are so many who are choosing relationships just because they don't need to be vulnerable. Entire marriages and relationships that are built on agreements but not vulnerability. And isn't that dishonest? Because if you can't bring who you are to the relationship, then what is the point of it? Can we admit that we are lonely and that we do want a genuine relationship? Can we admit that we don't really have the skills to build a thriving, genuine, re loving relationship and then begin to figure that out? When I admitted to myself the kind of relationship that I did want, I remember being shocked. I kept wondering, who is this? Because I'd never, ever admitted to myself that this was something that I wanted. I was more comfortable being in control in every way and thinking of vulnerability as a liability and thinking that I needed to protect myself at all costs. But the cost for that is also companionship, partnership. And I remember after processing this thing that I wanted, I realized that I didn't actually have people who had what I wanted. And I started by praying about it and looking for people who did have what I wanted. And sometimes you don't have them in real life, but we have the internet. There are people with genuine relationships who talk about the joys, the partnerships, the struggle and the learnings. And even though it may not fit your exact situation, it helps you understand what you need to learn, what you need to think about, what you need to ask about, what you need to be and what you need to heal. As human beings, we learn about everything in life from learning how to walk to learning how to run, jump and drive. Why aren't we willing to learn about what it takes to have a healthy relationship? Finally, one of the most important and practical lessons, ongoing experiences for me, and lessons has been my relationship with God. I found myself unwilling to, to be a Christian for most, most of my early childhood and early 
early life. It may be surprising, but I did grow up in a culturally Christian home where people did go to church, but one of my earliest memories was actually not going to church and spending time either with friends or exploring the town until it was time to go back home. I knew of God, but I had issues with Christians, especially around the hypocrisy. And it collided with being, it collided with just how strongly I felt about not being in that space. So by my early 20s, I had gotten to a place where a lot of dreams and plans were not working out and I was pushing the limit of the numbing. Things were just not, things that used to work were just not working anymore. And I had this very strong sense that if I pushed any further, I would sink into a place where I would have no control. I feel like in that moment, God made it personal. That yes, there are people who have done these things and there are people who are hypocrites and he did not not approve of that. But what about me and what about my personal choice? In the end, God felt like a safer choice than the darkness and the unknown. There was still a, the unknown with him, but I felt safe. And because I came in as an adult without the history and the cultural, um, let me say the, the history and the experiences that many other people had, I felt that I was able to just build my own relationship with God without the rules, without the the religiosity and without the culture around it. So one of the things that I came in with was the memory of the prayer, our Lord's Prayer. And it starts with our Father in heaven. For me, I made it Papa. It felt more personal and endearing. And I would have conversations instead of what traditional prayer seemed like. And in that space, I learned vulnerability. I would be honest with everything, just as I now recognize a little child is with their parents. I found kindness, compassion, acceptance, and most importantly, love. In that space, I learned about what it meant to be a beloved daughter and the vulnerability it takes in building a relationship. I'm still learning, still healing, still growing, but that's where it started. And so, as I end, I'd like to pray for you about this. Dear Papa, I want to thank you for every single person who's listening. You know their pain, you know their secrets, you know their masks. You know how hard listening to this can be because it makes them think about the things that they've been avoiding. Show them that it's okay, that there's nothing you can't handle. Help them uncover their true selves as you created them to be. Help them uncover from the lies, from the masks and the role selves. Teach them to be vulnerable, but also teach them where to be vulnerable and who to be vulnerable with. That not everyone deserves their most precious parts. Teach them to judge people by their fruits. That in the same way we judge whether an avocado or pineapple is ripe, that we shall have discernment on who to give our pearls to. Your word says that you will show us the right paths to walk for your name's sake. Show us where to go, who to go to, who to go to, who to trust with this and what resources to use. May our healing and recovery be beyond what we ask or imagine. And for those who do not know you as a father, I pray that they will choose to be open to know you and that they will experience what it means to be your beloved child. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can find us on Instagram at healing.growth and on Facebook as Trauma Healing and Growth. Thank you for listening. Please share the podcast with your friends and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. My name is Saiton Riga from Healing Group. Bye.